The thing that really stands with me, though, is that for, for good or bad, the pandemic has put public health professionals in the spotlight. I think as a field, we've gotten a little better about telling human stories about public health, talking about people instead of talking about like FTEs or infrastructure. I mean, who wants to be called infrastructure, right? But we do that, especially in Washington. And so one of the biggest takeaways for me is uh, the commitment and sacrifice of the people who are on the front lines. And so much of that work happens behind the scenes and we need to be better about telling our story, telling their stories. Hi there, and welcome to the Mission Forward podcast, where each week we bring you a thought-provoking and perspective-shifting conversation on the power of communications. I'm Carrie Fox, your host and CEO of Mission Partners, a social impact communications firm and certified B Corporation. And that was the voice of Mark Miller, the first guest in this sixth season of the show. On this season, we are looking closer at how you can use communications as a tool for systems change and social justice. Mark has just written the book on the power of public health communications, and I recently interviewed him at an event hosted by the University of Nebraska Medical Center. The conversation was so rich that we decided to drop it here too. A quick word on Mark. I have had the pleasure of working with and learning from Mark Miller for the past 12 years, most recently in our shared role in support of the Public Health Communications Collaborative, PHCC. By day, Mark is Vice President of Communications at the De Beaumont Foundation, and he is the lead editor of this new book, Talking Health, a new way to communicate about public health. I know every conversation I've ever had with Mark has resulted in a few aha moments, and this one today is no exception. With a career that started in public and civic service before moving to children's health and now public health, Mark brings a really interesting perspective to the challenges that face many frontline communicators, including those who are needing to relay critical communications in real time, even as the science is still informing the message. We're going to pick up this conversation with Mark telling me about his journey into nonprofit communications before we get to the heart of public health communications. But here's the bottom line for the show ahead. Knowing how to talk about public health can have a direct impact on the health of a community. So understanding what works is essential. This is a really interesting conversation. Enjoy the show and I will see you on the flip side. Mark, um, let me just first say thank you for joining us today. I'm so glad that we've got this time with you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And we're really excited to be talking about this book. I've been working on it for close to four years. So it's, it's really nice to have something to talk about. Good. I want us to start by you telling us all a little bit about your journey as a nonprofit communicator. You started in a career that was focused on public and civic service. You moved into children's health. And now you're with the De Beaumont Foundation and PHCC. But big picture, you're still fairly new to public health communications. What drives your passion for public health? Well, that's right. I joined the De Beaumont Foundation about four years ago after doing communications at Children's National Hospital for 10 years. Uh, early in my career, I was at the National Governors Association and then the White House and I worked in a lot of different policy areas, but I was always drawn to issues where I could see a direct human connection, things like education and health and social services. So at the hospital, I was, it was very rewarding to work in healthcare, use communications to raise money to help sick children and their families. But I really love working in public health because it affects every single person and not just when they're sick. So I have the best job in the world, my current job pulls together my interest in communications, policy, health, and philanthropy. Hmm. And you have such an interesting perspective, Mark, from where you sit, and I know we'll hear that through the insights you share today, but you know, you're know, you sitting at the, at the VP of communications position for the largest foundation focusing on state and local public health, right? You're seeing a lot from a lot of different perspectives. And this is a big question to start, but we're gonna dive right in with it. I'm curious when you think back, Mark, over the last few years, what is sticking with you about um, the importance of talking about public health 
having experienced a global public health crisis? Well, you know, it's almost kind of funny, but when I started working at the Beaumont Foundation, a big part of my job was to help define public health for regular people and try to make public health more visible and relevant. And then two years into my job in 2020, we were suddenly dealing with a global pandemic and our work really took on a new sense of urgency. Uh, we did a lot of uh, polling about messaging. So we'd already been looking at public health messaging, but then we were doing polling specifically on COVID and vaccines. Um, the thing that really stands with me though, is that for, for good or bad, the pandemic has put public health professionals in the spotlight. I think as a field, we've gotten a little better about telling human stories about public health, talking about people instead of talking about like FTEs or infrastructure. I mean, who wants to be called infrastructure, right? But we do that, especially in Washington. And so one of the biggest takeaways for me is uh, the commitment and sacrifice of the people who are on the front lines. And so much of that work happens behind the scenes. And we need to be better about telling our story, telling their stories. Yeah, I can imagine being called a lot of things, but I agree. I'm not sure I'd want to be called infrastructure. You mentioned at the top, Mark, that there are some assumptions, and you talk about them in the book, big assumptions that the general public has about public health. And when you started in at De Beaumont, you knew one of the first things you needed to figure out is how do you break some of those assumptions. Mm -hmm. But for folks who are listening in today, this group of public health practitioners and communicators what are some of those assumptions that keep coming up for you that perhaps should should stay top of mind as folks think about how to break some of those assumptions in their own work? Uh, that's a good question. I think there's a lot of assumptions that I think some of some of are kind of intuitive and others we've found in our research. But I think the biggest one is that people don't distinguish between public health and health care. And many people think public health is something that's only for underserved communities. And I know, you know, coming into this job from the hospital, we had a public health department, and I sort of thought of it as working with underserved communities. And so I learned a lot in my four years. But I think that the other big one is that people don't understand how much of their health is impacted by where they live and decisions that other people make for them. Uh, decisions we make today can either help or harm the health of people for generations, and they can also create and deepen health and economic disparities, like when some communities have access to you know, less access, like healthy food or reliable public transportation. So bringing it back to communications, policy is an area where I think examples and stories can work better than statistics. And I think journalists do a good job with storytelling. Uh, the book has a chapter by Soledad O'Brien. And in general, public health people don't do a good job telling stories. So if you want to show how people are affected, by the conditions where they live and these decisions that are made for them, you can tell the story of one person or one family and that can have a much bigger impact. Um, so our new book has a whole chapter on storytelling and another one specifically on how to bring data to life. Mark, I just wanna underscore that point of how important stories are and making the data come to life. and. That, you know, what what I've learned so much in my career in social impact communications, and you and I have have shared this thought, is that there is great responsibility as a communicator. That we think about the stories we tell, the narrative that we help shape. Uh, hopefully along the way, there are certain narratives that we're helping to break or stereotypes that we're helping to break too. But that is our role as the communicator to create that full and informed view of the story or the issue. You've been working on this book for four years, and there's a lot that's happened in our world in those four years. But I want you to tell me a little bit about the book. How did it come about? What was that first, aha, we need to do this? Um, and who's it written for? Well, I mentioned that we've been working on the book for uh, more than three years. And so it started before the pandemic. And we had done research and also just in talking to lots of people that communications has been identified as a big need by public health uh, people and not just not just pro professional communicators needing more, but everyone communicates. So the book has insights and tools that for people who are professional communicators, I think it'll be valuable and they'll like it. But really, the main audience is really anyone working in public health because it can help with any type of communication. It has very practical tools. 
And it's much more conversational than like a textbook would have. So a more conversational tone than a textbook would have. So I think it's uh, very readable. And I think we have some really good contributing authors uh, that make the book uh, interesting and not just like, like I said, not, not, it's not a textbook. It's, you'll enjoy reading it. Yeah. Um, the project that led to the book was called Phrases, and that stands for Public Health Reaching Across Sectors. Because what we were hearing is that in forming partnerships in the community, people didn't even know like what public health people do or really what they brought to the table. And so we looked to understand those assumptions better and then develop specific words and messaging and tools uh, and then added that to you know, insights from other communications leaders. Speaking of words, there are two that come up really strongly for me as I've been learning from you and listening along this, this journey. Trust and clarity. And I noted at the top, you want, might want to write a couple things down. Mark, why are those two words, trust and clarity, so essential in public health communications? You know, I've been thinking about these two concepts separately. Lots of people are talking about how do we restore trust in public health? And then we're also talking about how do we communicate better? And a lot of people are sort of looking to communications to solve the trust problem. You know, I've heard people say, we need a big national ad campaign so we can build trust in public health. Um, but really, you need both. So people need to understand what you're saying and they need to believe that you're reliable and you have their best interests at heart. It doesn't work if you have clarity, but you don't have trust. It also doesn't work if you've built trust, but you don't communicate clearly. Um, a few weeks ago, I was at a conference for the Society for Health Communication, and the thing that stood out to me the most was something that sounds really simple, but I, I think it's really important, and that is to build or rebuild trust, you have to first ask, who doesn't trust you? And second, you need to ask, why don't they trust you? You need the answers to those questions before you can figure out what you need to do. And there won't be just one solution because you have multiple audiences and multiple factors and trust and mistrust. Yeah. If we think about that trust question, such an interesting way you framed it there, we knew that public health had a communications problem well before COVID. Right? That's not an outcome of the global pandemic. But we knew when you were doing this research, there is no clear or universal way of defining public health. Are we getting any closer to a shared understanding? And if not, what needs to happen uh, to help us get there? And, and if it helps, go ahead and read for me how you define public health. Yeah, I did want to read one short uh, excerpt about that because we have a lot of sample language in the book that was tested, you know, sort of looking at what's not working and then trying to figure out a way to make it work better. So this is how we describe a uh, unique value proposition. People are often unclear about the role and value of public health, leading to questions like, what exactly is public health and how is it different from healthcare? The following unique value proposition is a short statement that describes the benefits of public health and distinguishes it from other fields. This statement can be used to introduce the topic and answer common questions. So the statement is, just like a person makes decisions that affect their health, so does a community. We need clean air and safe neighborhoods, for example. Public health experts listen to the community and look for patterns in what is affecting their health. They use science to diagnose problems, and they bring together everyone who can stop health threats before they start. So it provides some specific examples and good verbs, and it's something that is a start, it's a framework. It doesn't mean that that will become the definition for everyone in public health, but it's a framework that can be used and tailored for the people that you're talking to. Mark, there's a couple of things that I want to pull out there. There are some pieces in what you've just said, Mark, that I think are so important to why what you said works across different audiences, across different communities, is that you have found a way to take something that's really complex and you've made it real. You found a way to make it repeatable and you found a way to make it um, relevant. 
right? To, to whoever, whoever the person is listening, right? You've taken something really complex and found a way to make it basic. And at the end of the day, that's often what we talk about is the keys to communication is how do you take something that's really complicated and simplify it in a way that someone will remember it? Someone will be able to share it with, with another, but ultimately understand where you're coming from, right? So much of our work in any sector, public health or otherwise, we naturally default or defer to the jargon of our field. Mm-hmm. And so it's an important reminder of the simplification of the process. Tell us more what you are learning about the importance of that simplicity in messages. Well, I should have mentioned before that we did this work through the uh, the Frameworks Institute, did a lot of the um, kind of benchmarking and the research. And then we also worked with Hathaway Communications that helped us turn that into the actual words, like the ones I just read. I think that in public health, one thing that I've seen, and, and my brother also works in public health at Columbia University, and he agrees with this, that we get in our own way by using the jargon and I've had situations where I'm editing and someone's fighting for those words. Like we have to use those words. This is how we have to say it. And the question becomes, do you want people to understand it or do you want to use your words? Because sometimes you can't have both. And so I think, and and, I've worked with with doctors and politicians and others. And I think that um, it's really about how people hear what you say and not just what you think you're saying, but how they hear it is more important. And a lot of people sort of will push back on, you know, we're dumbing it down. But if you're trying to get people to follow your health guidance, they need to understand what you're saying. Um, So you can stick to your jargon. But if you're looking for changed behavior or understanding, you do need to communicate in different ways. And that's why the title of the book is A New Way to Communicate, because to some people, this will come across as maybe oversimplified, but it's what people understand Mm -hmm. who you want to talk to. The other thing I think is that people think of, you know, there's, there's like the general public and then there's like business leaders or leaders in education or policymakers. Policymakers are people too. Health business leaders are people too. And this is about helping people understand what you're saying. It's not dumbing it down for you know, lowest common denominator, it's it's about anyone you're talking to because they're people. Yeah, yeah. great, great point. Um, you have worked uh, quite closely over the last few years with uh, author and uh, pollster researcher Frank Lentz. And um, folks who heard me speak in Nebraska probably remember the line that I shared of his, which is, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. It's a great reminder, Mark, of what you're setting up here, which is, we can sit out and say something doesn't mean people will hear it. And so being really mindful of thinking through the lens of our audience, of the user, of whatever communications barriers might be in the way, whether they be digital divides, whether they be language divides, whatever that divide might be, and making sure you're creating the communications in a way that the m- most people possible can access it and remember it. Mark, more and more, I am realizing in this work that everyone in public health is also a public health communicator. You don't need to have that word in your title to still be on the front lines communicating these key messages. However, most folks are doing it without any formal communications training, right? And so I think that's where the gap and the challenge often comes up. What have you found in your work as the essential elements of public health communications that everyone should practice, whether communications is in your title or not? I think a lot of these lessons come from the, uh, as you said, we had a communications problem before the pandemic, but the pandemic really kind of exposed them and underscored them. So I think a few things that are very important is um, first coordination, uh, coordinating what you say within your organization and with other organizations, what they're saying. I think that was a, one of the breakdowns with COVID communications. Um, we were just talking about using straightforward language that people can understand, staying away from jargon. Um, paying attention to who's speaking to whom when you're talking to different audiences with different backgrounds, different perspectives they're bringing to the conversation. It's very important. I think, I think the term trusted messengers is overused, but basically people need to know and believe in the people who are communicating. And sometimes that means a public health official might need to 
step aside and let someone else communicate that messaging because the message is what's important and it doesn't mean that you have to be the one delivering it. Um, I think another big lesson is uh, being honest about what you don't know. So saying like, this is what we know now, there's some other stuff we don't know, but this is our guidance based on what we know now. If that changes, we're going to come back to you as opposed to being definitive, like this is it, this is, and then coming back the next day saying, okay, now this is it. Uh, so I think being honest about what we don't know is something, having humility, and that is important. And then um, we touched on this a little bit, but data is really important, but you can't just rely on data in your communication. We all need to use more stories, examples, and people to bring public health to life. Yeah. I would love to hear some of those stories from you. Let's take a pause and see if we have some questions, and then perhaps you can tee up one or two stories you've heard over the last couple of years. Katie or Jessica, anything coming to mind? So we have one question right now from our audience. How can public health practitioners evaluate the effectiveness of their communications and figure out if the audience has truly heard the message? Uh, I could start, Carrie, and then you can add. But I think a lot of this is about sort of um, benchmarking like what current perceptions are. So listening, going out of community, whether that's one-on-one -on -one meetings or town hall meetings, um, looking back at, say, say you're looking at the past two years of communication, how you can do better. You can sit in an office and decide what you did wrong and how it can be better. You really need to talk to the community about, you know, how do you, what did you experience and how can we do better? And then I think it's about continuing to listen, um, whether it's, you know, surveys or conversations or other ways, continuing to sort of check in. Because uh, I think it, when we talk about building trust, you have to know sort of where you're starting before you know where to go to build more trust. Yeah, and I would just add a bit onto that, which is many folks um, hear the word research and think extensive and wonder, how am I going to do message testing when I don't even have the resources I need to do X, Y, or Z? So one of the things that we often remind folks is to get a baseline of messaging, you can do something that we lovingly call perception research. It can be a handful of conversations you have with a variety of stakeholders in your community. And perhaps you do those conversations once or twice a year where you're asking the same set of questions. When you go to our website, what's the top message that you see? When you think about our organization, what's the key message you think of? Or what's the emotion you associate our work with? And then ask those questions again and again and again over time. And you'll start to see if the answers you're getting are more aligned with the answers you'd hope to get, right? So that's purely perception. Are people hearing or seeing what you want them to hear and see? Mark, this is Katie. A question I had as you were sharing, when you were talking about um, jargon, you're so good at using jargon. Um, can you, what are our biggest traps? You know, are there some clear words and phrases that we just need to drop from our communications because they are ineffective? I couldn't give you a list of words not to use, but I know that Soledad O'Brien use, has used social determinants of health as a buzzword in public health that people outside don't understand. And so uh, I really think about it as how would you describe it to like a family member, um, even a child? Like um, To me, that's really the test is kind of taking yourself out of the professional setting and just saying, okay, try to explain social determinants of health to a person, to your neighbor, to someone at the grocery store. And to me, that's that's really the test of whether a large population will understand what you're saying. I think there's also just terms. I think that, again, when, it, when a doctor's explaining something, you're more likely to listen to the doctor if you understand what they're saying. And I think this is something that's kind of counterintuitive but there's a lot of studies showing that I've seen it with, with doctors and with lawyers that if you can help someone understand, people perceive you as smarter and more reliable. So you're not impressing people with the big fancy words. You're impressing them by communicating in a way that they can understand. And so I think it's about asking and not just like talking at somebody, but saying, here's what we know. Here's what we think you should do. Do you have any questions about that? And not looking at someone, if they say, I don't understand the term you just used, but like really being open to questions 
uh, I think is, is really important. And, you know, the best doctors can do that and public health people should be doing that too. I've heard efficacy use as another example, like either the vaccine works or it doesn't work, but you know, the efficacy versus efficiency. And I see these debates among public health people on Twitter, like, oh no, that's the wrong word. You can't say that. You can't say that. But do you want people to understand what you're saying? Like that's, that should be the ultimate goal. Um, so the one in the chat, while writing this book, did you have any epiphany related to public health communication? And if yes, what was it? I'm not sure I'd call this an epiphany. It wasn't completely surprising, but I think it's one of the most important things that I think about a lot is that we did in-depth interviews with leaders in business, healthcare, housing, and education. And we asked people about how do you, what is public health? Like, first of all, like, what is the concept of public health? And we heard lots of different um, answers, lots of confusion about that. But then we asked about public health leaders. And if you were trying to solve a problem in the community, would you invite your public health official to be at the table to solve that problem? And the answer was no. And that's because people, many people perceive public health people as book smart but not problem solvers. And I think that's a perception that we need to change, but we need to change it by showing that we can solve problems. And part of that is communicating. So communicating about what the problem is and how we can be a part of solving that and the other problems that we've solved in the past. Um, we've got to speak up for ourselves where people will think that we're just sitting at a desk looking at data. So to me, the whole perception of book smart is an important obstacle to get over. And that, that really stuck with me. Mark, that's the perfect tee up for my next question and a comment. And I know we have a few more in the chat we'll get to. Um, but you just you just made reference to solutions, right? So I would love to hear from you about a few folks who during COVID, when faced with some challenging uh, obstacles around communications, got creative to communicate and engage with their communities? I think that there was a lot of different ways, uh, geographically, people sort of translated issues that their communities could understand. I remember when you're talking about like, how much is six feet? That like in Florida, they said like an alligator is about six feet. So they actually had illustrations like that. So. To me, what was most impressive was the um, people who use illustrations and um, metaphors and analogies uh, to, to, to make these issues real and understandable. And so I think it was the exception rather than the rule, but it was the people who used um, social media really well. I also think the thing that works that we haven't talked much about is really tailoring and segmenting information. I know that uh, the, the company that worked with CDC on translating information actually had materials translated into 400 languages. So it's not about finding like the message that will work for everybody. It's about tailoring it. And I know that not everyone here is going to be able to translate their materials to 400 languages, but really that's what it takes. And so it's not as glamorous as coming up with the perfect message, but it really is the hard work um, in communications that, that makes that effective. Mark, to, um, to maybe build off of that, um, what have you found uh, as it relates to visualizing messages? So I know you're a big fan of thinking about how to take really complicated information and turn it into a data graphic or an infographic. Does that help to um, create a more universal understanding of a message in any way when it is being visualized? Yeah, I think so. That's something that we've done with the Public Health Communications Collaborative is we were often taking information from the CDC, publicly available information, it's right there on the website, and turning that into a graphic, whether that was about travel or comparing the three vaccines or Halloween tips. And we just found that Agencies around the country just ate that up because it really helped them communicate in a way that people understood. And so we're trying to do more of that because it's something that I keep hearing from agencies is that they want materials that they can use and um, tailor for their own uses. 
because it, the whole thousand words, um, it, pictures, graphics. I also think it's not about necessarily like a bar graph or a line graph. It really depends what you're trying to illustrate and having someone be able to look at an illustration or some kind of graphic that very quickly communicates the idea you need to communicate. So I think it's first figuring out like what is that sort of nugget as opposed to how can we cram all this information into a single graphic. There's a great book from many, many years ago uh, when I was in design school called Don't Make Me Think. And it gets to that point of how quickly can you get someone to understand your concept without having to read the fine print, right? They should get it right at the top. Um, there's a question in the chat that gets to this a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off on a point and then toss to you, Mark. The question is around discussing the fine line between tailoring messages for intended audiences and the key point that we've made here around simplicity. Right. So how do we marry up this idea that you need to tailor messages, but make them really simple? And there's one thing that I always think about, though, Mark, I'm going to want you to add on to this, which is the message is the message is the message, meaning there is a core message that you want to make sure is getting through across all audiences and communications. From there, there will certainly need to be customization or tailoring, whatever that word is that you use, that makes that message relevant to that audience. And so that might be, you've got to deliver it a different way. You've got to deliver it in a different audience. You've got to deliver it in a different format to make sure it will be received and heard and remembered by that audience. But at the end of the day, you're not thinking about eight different sets of messages. You're thinking about that core message and how then it's customized. Um, but Mark, I'd love for you to add on to that or, or amend that in some way as you think about it from public health. Well, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's, I, um, I really focus a lot on strategy. So when someone comes to me and says, I want a newsletter, I say, who are, you, who are you communicating with? What do you want them to do? And the answer is sometimes like, no, I just want a newsletter. And we're like, I want a social media channel. Well, who, how are you going to grow that? Who's it for? What do, you, what do you want people to do? And so I think starting with that is, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Who do you need to communicate? And what do you want those people to do? And so that's the core message of the vaccine is safe, you can you should take it, blah, blah, blah. And then, as you said, you tailor it so each audience understands that core message. But you have to start with what is it that you're trying to accomplish and how are you going to know if you are successful? Right. And then once you know the answer to that and you start to think about then your audience and getting that message through, I think the other important thing that I've learned from you and I've seen in some of the COVID stories that have come out is that a good public health communicator will find their audience. They won't wait for their audience to find them. And I'm thinking back to one story you had shared with me of a really creative public health official in a small town that was not a news desert, but had limited options for news distribution. And she teamed up with that local newspaper and suggested that she write a daily column with updates so that she knew folks who were reading that paper and it was, that was what they relied on. It was their sole and central source of news. We're going to hear the latest updates day over day. And so sometimes it's thinking about first, why are you communicating? To whom are you communicating? And where is that audience, right? Find them versus waiting for them to find you. And asking those questions, where do you get your news? Who do you trust? Where do you go for this kind of information? And so that's a lot of the, the polling that we did is if you, if you want to talk about vaccines for kids, pediatricians are most trusted and every family has a pediatrician. So the communication through pediatricians was really important, um, but there were also other, there, there were places that were more reliable than others. And so that differed based on the topic. I'm going to tee up a final question here from Eleanor in the chat and then Katie and Jessica, I'll turn it back to you. Her question is, as, communicate, as a communications professional, how do I talk to public health officials who want to use jargon in communications? I don't think you need, as you said, you don't have to spend a lot of money on research, but you could suggest testing it informally. You know, if you have uh, other people on your staff who are not, you know, sciencey, or if you have even family members, if you say, I think we should say it this way because I think more people will understand it. You think we should say it this way. Why don't we test it against someone who's in our target audience to see what they think? 
because you're probably going to win that argument, um, or you might be surprised. But I think it's it's really about what I was just talking about is who are you talking to? What do you want them to do? Because if they don't understand it, you're not going to be successful. And so it's, and, and I know this is, it, it sounds easy. It's not when you're dealing with people who are, are very smart and been talking this way for a long time, but it's really about getting them to think about the action, the goal, and how you're going to know if you were successful. And if there's any way to sort of, you know, bounce it off a few people, um, you know, maybe a community organization or more people, you know, um, I think it's often helpful to have other people make your point and not make it just the communications person arguing with the non-communications person. Katie, I'll toss it back to you. We've got a couple of questions here. The first two, one is about kind of one sort of follow-up question about the tailoring conversation we've been having. And then another one around some inclusion and diversity ideas. So the first one, uh, to close this conversation on to tailor or not to tailor. Um, I've often heard public health practitioners say that if they tailor or pick and choose what to share with a particular audience, then this might be considered manipulating data. What are your thoughts on this? I have I have always said, and I know Mark agrees with this, that um, there is a kind of communications that is um, considered spin, right? When you're trying to spin the story or shift the story, I know what Mark and I firmly believe in is transparently sharing the story, right? So sharing in a way that people will understand, sharing the full story, um, even when the information is hard to make sure that you're sharing that in a way that people can hear and understand. Sometimes it means what we call cascading messages, right? So starting somewhere and then building over time onto that message so as not to overwhelm someone. It's about making the point you need to make, but being open about it. And in some cases that might mean sharing more data. So like, here's the message. And if you want to see the data behind it, here it is. So that's one way that might help. But uh, I do think it's right that it's about communicating honestly, helping people understand and not thinking about it as spam. Yeah. And Mark, you know, we talked at the top, those two words, right? Trust and credibility. Manipulating any sort of data is the first thing to do if you are trying to lose trust really to be able to build, earn, grow trust, you need to focus on transparency, right? The transparency of your messages, the um, letting letting folks see the, the work behind the messages, meaning let folks see the data and what happens behind it. Obviously, always citing your sources and your research, but transparency matters. Yeah, and I think I was just reading the other day about um, mistrust versus distrust. And I'm surprised that in 45 minutes, we haven't talked about politics much, but mistrust is people having sort of a a healthy questioning attitude and distrust is being cynical and assuming that anything you say is going to be a lie. So I think when you're talking about like manipulating data to some people, it's like, well, you're just making stuff up. So I don't believe anything you say, and you're not going to be able to do much with that. But with people who mistrust, who have good questions, be open to listening to those questions and and answering them. Because to me, that's what in politics we would call like the movable middle are the people who are mistrustful more than the people who are distrustful and are just inclined to not believe anything you say. Speaking of things to say, Mark, your dog has a lot to say today. Too much. Giving me a giggle. (laughs) Giving me a giggle. I love it. Um, Here's another question. We're going to change, change course a little bit. And, and Julia will put this in the chat so that you can read it. It's a little, a little longer. So I'm gonna make sure you can read it while I'm, while I'm saying it out loud. Inclusion refers to changing the entire system of us versus them and moving towards systems where each community has a chance to author content and determine approach, moving towards anti-racist systems. But we continue to use the us versus them mindset. How has your system of developing communication or understanding public health communication changed by working alongside persons not from the dominant culture? I think it's a really good question. And I think that in our research, we, you know, we try to make sure we're listening to different perspectives, hiring professionals who represent different views and intentionally reach out to people who typically don't have a voice. Um, because I do think that, you know, 
in our country, there very much is an us versus them. And I think that what we're really talking about, I mean, this book is not, there's very little discussion of politics because what we're talking about is finding a common understanding. We want everyone to be healthy. And you can't talk about everyone being healthy without talking about systems that have made many people less healthy and talking about the um, systems that hold people back and make, you know, create inequity and then make it worse. So I think we have to always be aware of the systems that affect that and listen to the people we need to listen to and not just the typical sources. Carrie, what would you add to that? Yeah, it's a great point. I actually would, would also say that when we think about systems, there are many systems that are embedded in how we communicate, at the pace by which we communicate. We think about the white dominant norm of urgency and how it is standard to think about how fast can I turn this around? How quick can I get this out? Even it means I'm the only eyes on it. That is a really important norm to break, right? And so to understand that if we want to move along an anti-racist journey, knowing that we can never get there, that is a lifelong journey to, to move along, that we can always move further by challenging those systems, by challenging the white dominant norms that exist and challenge any one of us as communicators or public health pr practitioners to say, why is it that way? What would happen if we slowed this down? Or what would happen if we actually shifted the pen and the final approval from this spokesperson actually to a community-led process? And you know, how do we change who has that, that power to build and frame the narrative? So I think there's, there's so much in that question. I appreciate it. One more question from the chat, and then I think we're closing out on your words. I've seen infographics that are pages long that are supposed to be communicating scientific findings. Uh-oh, even one from De Beaumont, they say. How long should an infographic be? We try to do good infographics, and if there's an example that doesn't work, we, I'd like to hear about it, and you're probably right. To me, I have a very high standard for infographics. A lot of times what we do is we illustrate data and we say, here's an infographic. To me, that's not an infographic. An infographic is what Carrie was saying before. It helps you understand a complex issue quickly. And so it's sort of like a if you have a, you know, a, a line graph showing a trend is more effective than a bar graph, like something as simple as that. So you look at it and you're like, oh, that's going down, or oh, that's going up. So something like that helps bring it to life. But I think that the, the best infographics really help even people who know say, wow, like I didn't realize that. Now I understand something I didn't understand before. And it, I actually keep examples of infographics that I like that I think do that well and challenge our internal team to really do the best and I think you need to start by saying, what is it that, what's the point we're trying to communicate and then figuring out the best way to do that? But like, what's the simple point we're trying to make as opposed to how do we make all this data fit on a page? Yeah, and Mark, to build on that, you know, I can think back to infographics that we developed in 2010, 2011, 2012. They were pretty complex. And often they were taking very, very complex reports and thinking about how do I literally visualize this report, right? Social media has done a lot to how we think and operate and process information. But one thing we know more than anything these days is that uh, what we call um, bite-sized information, um, digestible information matters. And so you could take that same infographic that maybe altogether has 10 or 15 parts to it and break it down to 10 or 15 different graphics. And so it's, again, how you serve up the information that over time will help people uh, see and learn and understand the concept rather than feeling like you've got to push it all out at once. I know we are getting ready to end. I want to just pause and say an enormous thank you to Jessica and Katie and to Julia Quigley, who it, so much of communications happens behind the scenes. And Events like this don't happen without really awesome and excellent communicators like Julia and Jessica and Katie. So thank you so much for setting this up today. Mark, if you were going to have the last word on this call, what would it be? 
Final advice for our audience. I would say um, get the book. Let us know what you think about it. I would love it if people sort of try some of the stuff in the book and um, give us feedback on it. And also, you know, kind of figure out how to tweak it for your own use. It's really not a one size fits all, but I do think it's got um, useful tools. So um, it's something that we're continuing to work on. Like the book is not the end of our work in communications. So we would love to hear any feedback that people have. I hope not. I hope it's not the end of the work. I'm, I'm so excited. Um, thank you so much, Mark and Carrie, for this compelling conversation and the sneak peek at some of the amazing resources provided within Talking Health, a new way to communicate about public health on shelves in July, Amazon and your local bookstores. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Mission Forward. Thanks for tuning in today. If you are stewing on what we discussed here today, or if you heard something that's going to stick with you, drop me a line at carry at mission.partners and let me know what's got you thinking. And if you have thoughts for where we should go in future shows, I would love to hear that too. Mission Forward is produced with the support of Sadie Lockhart in association with the True Story team. Engineering by Pete Wright. If your podcast app allows for ratings and reviews, I hope you will consider doing just that for this show. But the best thing you can do to support Mission Forward is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.